a balcony seat for a, a show on Broadway was three dollars, which was about what the cost of a babysitter was. So my family would take me to the theater rather than hire a babysitter. Um, for whatever reason, all these thoughts percolated in my head. Uh, I've uncovered recently a little book that I had. You know, when you when you leave grade eight, you're you know, what is my favorite song? What is my favorite author? What do I want to be? And I'd written down, I want to be a theater critic at age 12, back in 1962. Um, but of course, nobody hires teenage theater critics or even early 20s theater critics, so I went into acting and directing, etc. I got my BA in English literature because I had my parents' voice in my ear keep saying, learn something useful. But even then, I kind of <laughs> cheated. And even though it was English literature, I concentrated on Eugene O'Neill and the plays of Shakespeare, so that kind of had my foot in the theater door. And then I went on to the University of British Columbia uh, and got my master's in playwriting and directing at, at UBC. And after that, I came out and started working, fortunately, professionally in the theater. Um, over the years, I would occasionally still keep filing a lot of, of, of particular movie reviews and, and stuff like that uh, for CBC Radio in Vancouver and for various papers and things. Um, but I kept going, and I worked <clears throat> full-time professionally from 1972 to 1990, at which point a whole bunch of things, personal, professional, kind of conspired for me to say I wanted to get off the... I guess the directing carousel, moving my family every three years to another city to take over a new theater and all of that. And I decided to move into media. My first thought was not immediately to go into theater criticism. I got a show on CBC uh, Radio 2 called Say It With Music. And then shortly after that, the, the show which was then called Later the Same Day and is now Here and Now, had a host vacancy up. I auditioned for the host vacancy. And I didn't get it. They gave it to a lovely woman named Catherine O'Hara. But they liked my audition, and they said, we'd like you on the air on a regular basis. We know you know a lot about theater. We've never had a theater critic. Would you like to be our theater critic? And you know, I thought, sure. You know, I, I had done film criticism on the radio for years and on television for years, and I thought it would be you know, fun to do. It was more than fun. I really quite enjoyed it. And I held on to the position for about nine years. Uh, during that period, I also worked as head of arts programming for TV Ontario and um, wrote a lot of freelance pieces for the Globe and Mail, some theater criti criticism pieces, book reviews, interviews, things like that. Anyway, bottom line was early in, in the middle of two th the year 2000, Isabel Bassett and in her infinite wisdom decided to abolish the arts programming at TV Ontario largely, and so I lost a job. Fortunately, the same day, Veet Wagner, who had been theater critic at the Toronto Star, decided he didn't want to be theater critic anymore. Uh, and so the entertainment editor of the Star called me up and said, I understand you're looking for a job. I listen to you on the radio all the time. We'd like you to be our theater critic. And so I hopped into that position. Um, I have to be honest, kind of, I've slid into it and it felt extremely comfortable. I realized back that it, you know, what I had written at 12 years old was maybe prescient at the time. I had been doing criticism all my life, I had been doing theater all my life, and to be able to put the two together uh, worked pretty comfortably. Uh, so I've been with the star since June of 2000. Ms. Slotkin at that point, luckily, fortunately for us, went on to CBC Radio, and that's where things stand. Robert? I suppose I fell into it. Um, I suppose also that my trajectory was not that different from Richard's. I grew up in England. I, I think I may have um, got stage struck or theatre struck via television actually through um, suddenly seeing a children's television production of an abridged version of A Midsummer Night's Dream, <coughs> which uh, enchanted me. And uh, so I, I sort of sought out the complete works of Shakespeare on my parents' bookshelf and sort of I don't think I actually read all the plays all the way through, but I sort of leafed through them and got to know what they were all about. And then I started, um, I persuaded my father to take me to see a, a play. I've been taken to see kids' shows, pantomimes, we, we call them in England. And he took me to see a production of Henry V at the Old Vic in London. A, a great production, I subsequently discovered. I mean, I thought it was pretty good when I saw it. I was about seven. Uh, and I gather that people older and wiser than I thought it was um, one of the definitive productions as well. So. I had a, a good start. I went on seeing things, uh, and I went to a school, um, well, a high school, it would be here, with a very, very strong theatrical tradition. I mean, with an English department almost entirely made up of frustrated actors and directors. <laughs> and mothers actually also bred quite a large number of, of, of actually very famous actors now in its own right. 
And so I did a lot, of, a lot of acting there. Um, one didn't get much chance to direct in those days as a, you know, as a school kid, though I felt it was something I'd like to do. And I also, I read a few reviews for school magazines, and because I also was fairly good at English, um, I think people began to tell me that's what I ought to do, and it's something I resisted. I went on to Cambridge, Cambridge University, and uh, it was a very incestuous atmosphere there where plays were acted in, directed, and reviewed by the same people. I mean, not all at the same time, <laughs> though I wouldn't be surprised if that did happen, but um, it seemed to be the same group of people. So I, I, said, I fell into this, and um, I ended up um, having to decide I, I really was, was not going to be an actor. Then as soon as I decided that, I started getting good parts, which is, uh, I guess, something I should recommend. And uh, directing, which is what I wanted to do, and also writing as a regular theater reviewer for the, uh, the university newspaper of that time, which I don't think exists anymore. And decided, actually, what I wanted to do at that point was go into the theater. And I didn't. I went into the BBC instead, because I got offered a traineeship there. But I, I did actually go into drama there, as, uh, mainly in radio, as a drama producer. I did um, arts features on television as well. Uh, at the end of that, I decided I would actually go back to what I wanted to do and uh, got myself another traineeship, this time with um, an outer London theatre, the Greenwich Theatre, as uh, uh, an, a trainee director under the auspices of the Arts Council of Great Britain. Directed a few sort of Sunday night shows and, and one major show there, which is what one could hope for. Then started directing in rep, um, which was um, quite hard, quite hard to get jobs as a freelance. And I was also, what was actually keeping me alive, I think, at that time was I, I'd gone into freelance broadcasting on the strength of, of what I'd learned as a producer. I was able to move to the other side of the mic. And I'd also, I had taken to, to writing reviews for theater magazines. Uh, there was a, then a famous theater magazine called Plays and Players. I think it still exists, but I don't think it's what it was then. Uh, and it turned out to be a nursery for a lot of still practicing theater critics in England, actually. I think the critics of The Times and The Guardian both cut their teeth there. And uh, I did as well. And I, I suppose I gradually became known. It was something I was sort of half fighting. And then, when I was directing a production of Joe Orton play, What the Butler Saw, in a repertory theater in the north of England in Lancaster, I was actually phoned up by The Observer, one of the leading Sunday newspapers, and asked... Um, would you like to just stand in for us for a couple of weeks as our theatre critic? Because um, they actually had a guest theatre critic then anyway for a year, Robert Brewstein from the Yale Drama School, but he wanted to take a couple of weeks off to see some other part of Europe. So they asked, would I stand in? And I almost said no, because it was uh, going to clash with my, f my first week of rehearsals in Lancaster. And my girlfriend and my wife said, are you crazy? <laughs> You've got to find a way around this. So what I actually did was I saw enough plays in my first week to get two columns out of. I persuaded the theater in Lancaster to let me start rehearsals one day late, which really raised their eyebrows, because to ask for less rehearsal in rap is, is almost unheard of. And I managed to turn out two decent columns. And a few weeks later, I think literally a few weeks later, um, Mr. Brewstein went back to America. In fact, I'd, I'd asked him when I met him. Um, he, I said, um, are you sort of... A, are you, are you leaving soon? And he said yes. And he said, have they appointed a successor? I said, did he said no? So write good. <laughs> and um, I guess I did write good. I wrote good enough for them to say, um, well, would you like to come and do the job for a few weeks? And about 10 years later, I was still there. So that was my major critical gig in England as Theatre Critic of the Observer. And then I, I moved to Canada for all sorts of mainly family reasons and started um, Again, doing everything I could, doing a fair amount of broadcasting for CBC, doing a lot of broadcasting till mercifully for the BBC back home, who had a nice habit of flying me back to London and also to New York from time to time at their expense. And alas, the uh, department that um, enabled this no longer really exists, but uh, it was very nice while it did last. And I also started writing a lot of freelance reviews for the Globe and Mail. Then I went to work for Garth Drabinsky at Live End, and when that imploded, I guess I had rather the same sort of situation Richard did. Um, one door closed <laughs> forcibly and another one opened because the National Post started up, and I managed to persuade them to take me on as their theatre critic, which is you know, where I, I, I am now am and am still. So I'd say I sort of fell into the job, but not altogether with my eyes closed. I think there was something at the back of my mind which said this is at least one thing that I will probably end up doing for some part of my life. And it's probably been a greater part than I imagined it would be in the first place. That was, yes, that's, that's how I got into it. Great. Um, 
<clears throat> now, one of the things people always ask me is, you know, how many movies do you see a year, sort of what the actual job is. So maybe real quickly, starting with Robert, how many plays do you see in a year? And, you know, quickly describe what a week is like 